these uh, harrowing scenes, panic, fear, terror, soaked, trembling children, screaming adults, and strange as it may seem, many of them had no idea about what was going on. We were in the basement. My mother told me that we had run out of food and wouldn't have anything to eat until tomorrow. I heard noise outside. Somebody was shouting that we had to go to the hospital, so we went there. When I came in, some people grabbed me, started pouring water over my head. 11-year-old Hassan Diab was one of the apparent victims in the White Helmets video. Here he is, after being drenched and sprayed. He was found in Duma and interviewed by Russian war correspondent Evgeny Padubny. He's fine, if a little confused. That's me in the video, that's me. Yes. As were many other kids. Any child would be terrified. Ergo, the panic, which the White Helmets were there to film. He was eventually found, though, by his father, who was none the wiser. I didn't hear anything about a chemical attack. I was outside, but I didn't notice anything. I heard that my family was in the hospital. It does make sense. A poisonous gas would be invisible, you'd imagine. Everybody would want to take precautions, especially when you're hungry and they give out food at the hospital. I went to the hospital, walked upstairs and found my wife and children. I asked them what had happened and they said people outside were shouting about some smell and told them to go to the hospital. At the hospital they gave dates and cookies to the kids. One of the doctors, who was reportedly on shift at the time, seemed surprised by the sudden influx. Some people uh, come to here and uh, wash people uh, in water. Uh, and They said, uh, chemical attack, chemical attack. We didn't uh, see uh, any uh, chemical, chemical uh, attack uh, Symptom. <clears throat> symptoms here. The doctor and others did, however, say that some people came in complaining about difficulty breathing, which is common. When an explosion destroys a building, for example, there's a lot of dust, makes it difficult to breathe and especially affects people with asthma. People from the White Helmets told us about the use of chemical weapons, but we saw no sign of that. If chemical weapons were used against those people, our medical staff would have also been affected. We've sent a request to the White Helmets to comment on this, but have received no answer yet. What we have seen is more and more witnesses coming forward to say there was only panic and no evidence of chemicals. We heard an explosion and somebody said it was a chemical weapon. We ran to where the noise came from and started pouring water over the people. But they seemed to be okay and then walked away without any help. People got so confused. Somebody started pouring water over people's heads, saying there had been a chemical attack. I was at the spot with my wife and daughter, but none of us experienced any symptoms of chemical poisoning. It's remarkable how these scenes convinced three countries to launch cruise missiles at Syria. Especially remarkable when you realize that so many of the people here had no idea about what was going on, only that someone shouted about chemicals. The U.S. and the majority of European countries say a chemical attack did happen in the town of Douma, citing their own intelligence sources. They accused the Syrian government of deploying a toxic agent over the area, which at the time was held by rebels. American, British and French militaries, they hit Syria with an airstrike in retaliation, targeting a number of facilities, which they claimed were related to chemical weapons production and development. Meanwhile, allegations of a chemical attack are now being questioned even by some in the Western media. A British journalist Robert Fisk visited Douma and was unable to find any witnesses a former counter-terrorism officer, Charles Shoebridge, says he's also seeing signs of backtracking on accusations. Journalists have got in on the ground. Robert Fisk is, is a notable uh, person that I'm thinking of there. He, uh, as he says, unattended by Syrian government um, employees and so on, 
He spoke to ordinary residents and to medical staff, who, none of whom confirmed the idea that there was a chemical attack. We're already, I think, seeing, I'm detecting signs myself, that there is a slight backtracking amongst government statements, rowing back slightly, saying, well, actually, we weren't completely clear. That's why we, uh, we were relying on um, social media. We were relying on activists on the ground. And that's why we only carried out a limited strike. So they're already, I think, preparing the ground for the possibility, at least, that this OPCW report isn't particularly helpful. For example, it may actually find that there were no trace of chemicals, of chemical warfare. A team from the chemical weapons watchdog, the OPCW, came under fire in Syria on Wednesday while trying to enter the town of Douma. They are in the country to investigate the alleged chemical attack on April the 7th. Artizi Lipetrenka has the latest developments. First, uh, I just want to break down the process uh, for you, how it works. Initially, the UN uh, security team is meant to be sent on the ground to assess whether it's safe to work there. And the agreement has been that at a certain stage, they must be escorted by the Syrian troops and at a different stage by Russia's military police. So the security staff, uh, apparently, they were on this initial rehearsal trip uh, to put it uh, this way, and according to an official statement by the OPCW, they uh, came under small arms fire, and then also an explosive device was detonated, and that was the reason why they had to retreat and go back to Damascus. We understand from the statement from the Russian army that the exchange of fire happened when it was specifically the Syrian army in charge of providing security for that squad. On the 17th of April, while securing the UN reconnaissance mission in the city of Douma, a skirmish occurred between the Syrian security service and unknown figures. An officer from the Syrian security service was slightly wounded in an exchange of fire. Previously, Washington and London were pointing the finger at Russia and their ally Syria for uh, what they called trying to hide facts and also hamper the mission of the chemical watchdog in Syria. A wider operation to conceal the facts of the attack is underway, supported by the Russians. Their whole goal in this is to try to cover up. Of course, it's not up to the UN and the OPCW to judge who this attack came from. But what it is worth asking uh, is whether the Russians and the Syrians are genuinely helping them out on the ground. And if the answer is yes, that might put London and Washington in a somewhat awkward position here. Chemical weapons expert at Rice University, James Tor, says any attempts to cover tracks will prove fruitless. It would be very hard to clean the area up from any trace of, a, of the residues of a nerve agent. I mean, this, this is, if it's properly dispersed by a nation-state attack on people, it's going to be uh, all over on walls and buildings. And if it was a chlorine attack, <clears throat> the chlorine will be gone. But uh, uh, no nation state, in my view, would ever use chlorine. It is a very inefficient gas to be used. That makes no sense to drop a chlorine cylinder out of any aircraft. Uh, uh, any terrorist group might, might affix a bomb to a cylinder and try to blow it up. But a lot more people are going to get hurt by the munition rather than by the chlorine. It has to be properly dispersed. So nation states don't use chlorine.